Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Junkyard Digs. Today I'm here with Junkyard Mook, and we're going to be pulling the engine out of a 73 MG midget that's been sitting abandoned since 1978. If you missed part one, you can check it out right here. But to recap, what we have is a 73 MG midget with a motor that is locked up tighter than Fort Knox. We've taken the cylinder head off and that thing is absolutely stuck. What we also have is a spare motor, a cornfield, and whatever we can find laying in the dirt along with a single set of tools to change this motor out here with nothing more than our hands. And a BFH. And a BFH. <laughs> so without further ado, let's begin. <laughs> what you doing? That rock must die. I believe this is a 1300cc inline 4. As you can see, completely stuck. What we're going to do is pull this sucker out by hand and put that motor in and then try to do some donuts here in the dirt field and then head home. The car is in really good shape. It's pretty solid. I dug an enormous amount of poop out of it. I can still see the pile from over here. At this point, um, I think we need to pop this guy off. Pop our distributor cap off, get a couple other things out of our way, including this. Get this ground strap off, a couple more hoses, a couple more wires, and undo these transmission bolts right here and hoist this thing out. Now, everyone on the internet is probably saying right now, Kevin, it's an MG, you have to take the transmission and the engine out at the same time. And I've heard that, and I've looked into that, and a lot of people say that, but then again, other people don't do it, and they just pull the motor and leave the trans. So we're gonna try that first. And if it fails, then we'll have to get a hoist or something and pull the transmission out at the same time. I'm hoping we don't have to, and I'm hoping we can just pull the motor so we can actually do it by hand. Yeah. I think the main problem is this member up front. To get this to clear, you have to pull the trans. I'm gonna undo the trans mounts and let the trans come up in the front because it should have a U-joint in the back, so it should be fine. We'll lift it up with a floor jack, clear that, Separate everything, new motor in, drop it back down. Good to go. Hopefully. Yeah. Now it's time for a bit of movie magic because in order to swap in a new engine, we first have to source a new engine. So we need a motor for this car. Fortunately, I know a guy. My buddy Steve with This Week With Cars has a few midget motors sitting around. I think we're surrounded by like seven of them right now. Yeah, back in the warehouse, I have shelves and shelves of these motors, so. This guy has every part we need, and he also has a pretty sweet YouTube channel where he goes and plays with his collection of cars. You can check it out right up here. Let's go find a motor. Yeah, one of these should do. Well, it looks like there's one in the back of the shell. Oh, it turns. It has compression in at least one cylinder. Away from this shiny thing. Uh, yeah. Maybe, yeah. All right, there's our motor. Steve is descending from parts heaven with the parts we need. Here's <laughs> labeled Sprite starters. <laughs> Test that one. God, that's weird. Does it pull back? Yeah, it pulls. It pulls oh, okay. in as it as it turns on. Give it backwards bendix. So this is all stuff. Another starter in here. Oh, sweet. One of these ought to work. Maybe. Our pack might be dead. Spin. I can never visit Steve without him firing something up and totally blowing my mind. Today, it was a TVR in one of his race cars.
It blows my mind every time. Ever seen a four cylinder shake like a cam to V8? Yeah, me either. Until now. the rubbers on the motor mounts uh, what the what we do with these race cars is we actually use the rubbers off of Land Rovers because they're a lot stronger than the Triumph ones but, but they still beat them up <laughs> just beats the shit out of its own motor so mounts what do you rev this thing to a million <laughs> oh, depends on who I'm racing I guess <laughs> all right so there we go we have a motor we have a starter we have all the parts we need ready to go we're going to swap that sucker into this car by hand in a cornfield. This is going to be terrible. We might die. Yes. All for YouTube. <laughs> well, to make this as easy as possible on myself, I need to take as much weight as I can off this motor. Because even though it's a tiny little four-cylinder, she's pretty hefty. Lay this off to the side. I just shook my water up. Feel that delicious flavor moving around? Yeah. Well, you know, you can't have the hydrogen separating from the oxygen. <laughs> That's just not okay. So I just noticed after I got this bolt out that you can see all of the rings from where the head gasket was seated. And it's good on both of these except for the middle one. It's pretty dark and carboned up between there as if that was a blown head gasket in the center. Looking at her head, it kind of tells the same story. Good here, good there, not so good here. And I can already tell why. Exhaust valve on the far side, intake valves together. Exhaust, exhaust, intake valves together. But in classic small block Chevy form, two exhaust valves right next to each other, barely any metal in between, burns the head gasket and then blows it out right there. So that's what happens when you have two exhaust valves right next to each other exiting, yep, through the same port. One, two, three, four, just like that. So you know who doesn't blow head gaskets like ever in comparison? Yeah, small block Fords because they have spaces between their exhaust valves. See, this is proof that I eat. Everyone thinks I don't eat. I'm just gonna keep going until these motor mounts hopefully pop. Rip the rubber apart. Oh, there they went. <laughs> you just leave it on the car? I still can't get the starter out. Oh my gosh. Okay, there it goes. Oh yeah, that was never gonna turn. Oh, that's totally seized. Garbage. What if it was the starter that kept the motor stuck? It wasn't. Okay. Yep. That's checked. So our motor's pretty much free now. I'm going to lower this back down. Um, pop those remaining bolts off. Support the transmission with a jack. Rip everything out. OK. 
Okay, all we gotta do is separate that block and everything from the trans, and this thing is good to go. All our bolts are out, it's just a matter of, okay, it's done, never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Ready? Move. Can you grab the front? Where are we We're going? Stuck. With it? Oh. All right. You okay. Yeah. Did you got? No. Almost. Up and over. Oh. Okay, that was worse than anticipated. Well, uh, everything's full of mouse poop and it looks seized and worn out and broken, so that's good. I gotta say, that's the first time I've ever lifted an engine by hand. Yep, we can say it's been done now. With that, we're gonna end the video and go home, goodbye. Cole here showed up just in time to help us rip her out there, as you saw. Hey, Kevin, is this factory? Yeah, isn't that <laughs> something? Three nails and spacers. <laughs> we just pulled a motor out of a car in a cornfield by hand. Now we just have to put a much heavier one back in. Yeah, I'll see you later. <laughs> Bye, Cole. Have a good time doing corn things. <laughs> Our next step is to swap whatever we need on that motor from this motor off of this motor onto that motor. All right. <laughs> My master plan has come together. Remove an engine by hand, swap all the parts on a tailgate of a truck in a cornfield, put another engine back in by hand. This is pretty epic. So we're going to start plugging away at swapping over motor mounts, clutches, backing plates, pretty much just everything we can, and then hoist that sucker in there. Let's get to it. Luke is going to take our clutch off. We're going to want to brake torque on everything and just keep going around and around until it comes off and let that spring pressure out. I'm sure she's nice and rusty, so she's going to want to fight us the whole time. Yep. We didn't bring any impacts or anything because I kind of wanted to do this with just hand tools. And Honestly, I think we could have gotten away with just these tools and Tang's portable box right here which I have custom ordered nine trays to set in here so we have all the SAE tools we could ever want conveniently in one spot. And look, nothing comes out of its assigned seats. It's amazing. Either way, huge shout out to these guys for sponsoring the channel and keeping us turning wrenches. Slowly, but yes. Yes. Oh, that looks like we could actually even still use that if we can get her to free up and move just fine. Wow, how did that not rust? Of all the cars <laughs> that we didn't have a rusty clutch, it's the one that's literally rusted into one piece. Like the satellite was completely seized and this thing's fine. What the heck? I may have to go in with a screwdriver and clean some of this stuff out so that we get full tooth engagement and it doesn't try to bind up and break something. We're breaking something? No, 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 no breaking. We're breaking something. No, 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 no. Yeah. No. Where's the hammers? No, move. Yes. Ready? Yeah. Oh. Not ideal, but nothing out here is. Ta-da. While Mook's working on that, I'm going to resurface our clutch. I got some emery cloth. I'm just going to get in here, get all that rust off. Before you say anything, it's better than nothing. We've driven clutches that were literally seized and we smacked them apart with a, um, a putty knife and then just drove them. So this is like the deluxe junkyard digs treatment right here. Nothing gets this much. So there's been some definite evidence of this motor having been out before. And uh, I think I know why. I was just looking at this clutch. Right here on this clutch pack, there's a tag that says rebuilt. This thing looks really nice. So I think someone had this motor out to replace the clutch before she was parked. There's some dents in the, in the header up front on the radiator support. And some bolts were missing, a bit of hardware. Just stuff like that. That would have lead me to believe that this had been out before. And now we know why. At least one of the times. <laughs> wow. Oh, 
All right, I'm gonna repeat that process on the flywheel and use a bit of brake clean and clean up this actual clutch pack as well too. And then we'll throw it all back together and get it on the new motor. Well, Moot got our got spacer it. plate off. And looking in here, interestingly enough, this freeze plug has been replaced. So this is either another time that this motor came out or while they had this all off, they saw this as well. But that's a little less unlikely because this covers those freeze plugs. So judging by the amount of dents that are in this front strip and the amount of dents in the top right here, it's been out a couple times. And I think this was one of them. I think this was another one of them. And who knows what other reasons it may have been out. I'm going to attempt to clean this and get all this goo off with this old license plate that I found laying over there in the field. So. This is an excellent goo remover. Bam. Brand new. Nice. All right, let's get that sucker bolted on. We got our clutch all cleaned up. It uh, did a little separate action after I cleaned it down with some brake cleaner. So maybe, maybe don't do that in the future, I guess I've learned. <laughs> Is that Whoops. the technical term? Separate? Yes. <laughs> okay, we need this guy in there. And then we will uh, run these down and torque all our bolts and Bend these tangs back over to hold her in. All right, we'll run all these down and then torque them to spec. Okay, this is where things get interesting. Now, there's locating pins on this flywheel. So we can locate the actual uh, spring pack for the clutch just fine. Oh, this has been rebuilt too, I see now. So I'm not worried about getting this guy on in the proper orientation at all. The problem is going to be centering the clutch without the proper tool. But what I do have working for me is that right there. This original rust pattern from where this thing sat. So all I have to do is get the right side facing the right way and get this centered with that mark. So if it's over here or here, I know it's obviously off. So. Even though I can't see a dang thing, I just got to get that there, and then everything will be good to go. Let me go up a bit. It feels centered, and it looks really good too. So we're going to call that right there good, and hope for the best. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and get this torqued down, everything seated, and start preparing to drop this motor back in the car. All right, so while we've been messing with this motor, our distributor, as you can see, is not in. So this cog needs to line up with the gear set inside. Kaboop. There it goes. All right, that's set in, just archaically. Now we need to time this motor. So what I'm going to do on this one, since our valve cover is already pretty much off, I'm just going to take it off because that's going to make life way easier. Zing. Oh, that's kind of dirty in there. This must have sat without a valve cover for a while. And I see these guys are both loose for some reason. All right, well, duly noted. I will take care of that. So since we had the valve cover off on this engine, I'm going to show you how to find the combustion stroke on an engine using the valve timing. So what do we know about four stroke engines? There's four strokes. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. The intake, the compression, the power stroke, and the exhaust stroke. So we can watch these valves in correlation with that map and see what stroke we're on. So starting out wherever the hell we are, uh, I'm just gonna start turning this in the direction of rotation. Now, if you're confused about which way that is, look at your fan, uh, which way that needs to spin to pull air through the radiator across the back of the motor. And keep in mind, if you're using a serpentine belt, it might be reverse rotation because it might be on the back of the belt. With V-belts, it's all the same direction as the crank. So, I'm going to start spinning this motor and watch for valves to move. All right, there goes our exhaust. So if our exhaust is down, that means our piston is coming up. You can throw a screwdriver in there carefully. Don't let it bind and smash and damage stuff. But that should mean our piston is coming up. Yep, there he comes. 
So that's our exhaust stroke. Now at the top of our exhaust stroke, we have a little bit of cam overlap, as you can see right there. We get that cross flow going between those valves and we'll immediately jump into our intake stroke, at which point the piston will travel back down the cylinder. Exhibit A. Now at the bottom of the intake stroke, the valve is going to close and the piston is going to start returning. This is the compression stroke. At the top of this compression stroke is where the power stroke begins because the spark plug will fire, which means that is where top dead center is. So I'm going to let the screwdriver come up and see how nothing in the valves move. That means that is our compression and power stroke right there. Since I got a bit of experience in this, I'm going to just take this right here and figure out where top dead center is by just turning the crank and feeling that last tenth of an inch before it travels back down. Right there. So, now that we know we're on a compression stroke, we're going to look at our timing marks and see if our timing mark lines up with the timing tabs. And when you look at that, it's pretty much dead nuts on with zero. I was about two degrees off, maybe. Now the reason you needed to know that this was on the power or compression stroke is because of this mark. There's two times that the piston's at the top. It's on the exhaust stroke and the compression stroke. As it goes, exhaust, intake, compression, power. If this was on the exhaust stroke, our timing mark would still line up with our tabs, but we would not be on the compression stroke, for instance. Right now our exhaust valve is down, that means we're starting our exhaust stroke. There is the top dead center of that stroke. Oh, the mark still lines up with the tabs. But we're actually 180 degrees off, which is what this is called. So if you set all your timing and it won't fire and it's popping out the car, we're blowing out the exhaust. See if your distributor is 180 degrees off. Verify that you're back on at intake, compression. Verify that you're back on that compression stroke and you are truly at top dead center. So at this time, we are absolutely sure that we are on the compression stroke on cylinder number one. The harmonic balancer is pointed right at zero degrees on this timing tab down here. Most of the time it's over here because we're working on American cars on this channel. But this one's just a really good example to show you all this stuff because you can see everything. At this time, we will take our distributor cap and find which one of these plugs goes to cylinder number one. So this guy right here, is cylinder number one, which is this guy right here. This pin is cylinder number one. So at this time, our rotor needs to be pointed at that number one pin. So if you could see in the cap, it would look just like that inside. That is what we want this to be set to while the motor is at top dead center on the compression stroke. Now how do we make that happen? We'll put a rotor on. We line our cap up the way it's supposed to go. Keeping in mind the number one pin's right here. Let me look. Oh, it's way over there. Okay, so what I need to do is rotate this 180 because this thing's weird and it doesn't have teeth. It's got slots. So take these locating pins, line them up with your distributor body. Keep in mind where the first terminal is. It's right here. And notice how this distributor is pointing all the way over here. So we need to rotate that. How we do that is by rotating the body in the opposite direction. So now, that distributor, gotta go a little further. A little more. So now, this rotor is pointing right at where this pin is in the cap. Right about there. And that is now set top dead center. And what we're going to do is we're going to advance that 8-10 degrees. Give it a little bit of advance, just a little, to help this thing fire off when it's time. Lock everything down. Good to go. I'm now going to spend a bunch of time cleaning the top of this cylinder head because apparently this has been exposed to just straight up dirt. I don't want this washing down into the oil pan on a borrowed engine so we're going to get the sucker cleaned up and then get ready to slap it in the car. So since I'm borrowing this engine, I'm actually going to go the extra mile and uh, fill the sucker up until the dipstick marks. And we're going to spin it by hand with no plugs and see if we can get oil to come out 
what I'm assuming is the oil pressure tube. All right, looking good. All right, so we got the top of our cylinder head all cleaned up. To give her the best shot on startup, I'm gonna lube all these cam followers and rockers and valves and just kind of just the everything in here. Make everything have a little bit of goo up top. Likewise, I'm going to throw a little bit of oil down each cylinder because who knows the last time this thing ran. It could have been 15 years. And to boost the compression and just help out everything inside, we'll give everything a little shot of oil. Roll this over a few times, make sure everything's lubed up, make sure all our valves are moving, everything's working fine, and then we are pretty much ready to slap this sucker back in the car. I feel the valves compress because it resists me, but other than that, things are looking good. Looks like we're getting fresh oil up top. So I believe these oil through the head to these rockers right here. Everything's looking happy. That is a motor prepped for install. Let's fix some things on the chassis side and then we will wobble this thing in there with a couple two by fours. While the motor's out, what better time to uh, get to the slave cylinder to change the slave cylinder? Because it's junk. No better time. That's, that's the answer right now. We do it right now. Alright, we'll pop this out, throw our replacement unit in, hope that it's good, bleed it, probably have to replace that master, and then move on. Well, at this point, we've hit a standstill for the night, and I think we're gonna call her a day here and come back tomorrow. I need a valve cover gasket. I don't have a valve cover gasket. I need to get this fitting off, hopefully without shearing it. It's trying to twist the hose off. I don't have a torch to heat it up. We got a few more things to do at home tonight, so I think we're just gonna call our a bit of an early day and head back and seal up that valve cover and come back and drop that sucker in tomorrow. We're back at the budget mudget. <laughs> the budget mudget. The budget mudget. So like Mook said, we are back. It's been Probably two weeks again. There's a lot of stuff going on. We make it here when we have time because it's it's an hour and a half from Ames. So, yeah. Anyway, we're back. Um, stuff that's changed. I RTV'd this valve cover on so that that's not going to leak. This motor should be ready to go. I do have a clutch alignment tool, so I'm going to go through and do this correct. So if you guys previously commented before this part in the video, haha, the joke's on you. Ha ha. But thanks for the comments. Speaking of comments, I can always rely on you guys to correct everything I do wrong. That is a 1968 midget. <laughs> Which, I had a weird feeling that it wasn't a 73, because it didn't really look like the other 73s, but I just never really took the time while I was crawling through the poop to properly read that insurance card, because, I mean... He was too focused on the poop. Yeah. Because he loves poop. <laughs> this is the car and poop channel, not the reading channel. Duh. Come on, you guys. These butterflies are trying to fight. Fight you? Yeah. Well, they're caterpillars. They why, are they, into me. why are they trying to fight you? No, only caterpillars like me. Butterflies don't like me. They I grow did. up and they decide it's time to kill Mook. <laughs> Good luck, Heck butterflies. Off. Good luck killing Mook. <laughs> so let's see how I did without one of these. What's the chance this just goes in? Oh. Eh, it could use a little bit of adjustment. It's not bad. The trans would probably go in, but it looks like it's going to fight us. So I'm going to loosen these, uh, slip this in all the way till this seat's in here, and then we will tighten it all back down. Either this magically comes loose, or the car burns to the ground. Each have their benefits. So what I'm fighting is this turns, but when it turns, it's trying to rotate this hard line with it, and it'll shear that hard line off. And that's, that's not good, because I don't have more hard line. I think it worked. Is that tape wrench. on fire? Probably. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. If not from the fire, it's it's a Lucas Electric product. It's probably just doing Lucas Electric things. <laughs> I have a question that maybe you viewers can answer. Why are most of the bolts in this car standard? Why are they not metric? I heard someone say, maybe it was my brother, I don't remember, but someone said it's because they are cheaper hardware to buy 
standard instead of metric, but I don't know. You guys tell me. After a moderately low amount of cuss words and a lot of time with a vice grip, I was able to get this cover off and pop these two nuts and bolts out of here so we can change out our clutch master cylinder. And hopefully not spill much brake fluid. Around the paint, there we go. I find it astonishing how dirty this car got in its 10 year life of being on the road. Like, how much oil did this thing leak? <laughs> like a half inch of crap there. That's insane. It's like a three quarters inch deep right there. Look at that. Gravel road life. Gravel roads and oil. Look at that. That's crazy. It's crazy. pretty well preserved under there. It's a pretty dang solid car. Not half bad. In the meantime, I have our new clutch master cylinder in. Uh, this is from Steve. Thank you, Steve. He loaned us this. I'm going to bleed it up here a bit, hook her up, bleed it down there, and then put our slave cylinder on the trans and see if that works. Hopefully, and then we're, it I think, yeah, probably not. And <laughs> I think we're ready to put the motor in. Up. Down. Up. Down. Up. Down. And stop. I'll hook this line up now and clean up as much brake fluid as I can and we'll repeat from the other end of the line. For now, we need to find some way to put this motor in. Let's go see what we can find laying around. Dynamite. Tempting. Okay, it is time to put the engine in. I've got a length of rope we found in an old grain truck and a couple rusty fence posts. We're gonna get two people on the end of these, wrap this around various places and over these, Give her the old one, two, and lick and stick the sucker right in there. I say it like it's going to be easy, but it's probably going to be a nightmare. Engine swap in a cornfield with basic hand tools. No hoists, no power tools, nothing. Could have got a shorter rope, I suppose. But hey, I didn't become an Eagle Scout for nothing. Bingo, bango. I don't know why we listen to Kevin. I just want to use the skid loader, but he wants to go all primal, do it how our great, 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 great grandfathers would have done it. I don't know if they had cars. Yeah, no pain, no gain, right? Yeah, I gotta, I gotta suffer my videos. You gotta give the internet what it wants. All right. two of you guys on that end. I think I can get this side. Ready to move? Yeah. Okay, one, hang on. One, two, three. <laughs> come on! <laughs> Go guys, come on! I don't think it's gonna work. Right. <laughs> Got Kevin He-Man over here. Yeah, no kidding. Maybe it's because I'm farther away. I don't know. Did we make it high enough to get over? No, we're like here. Yeah, not even close. So we took the car off the blocks. How'd you get back in the other day when it was just you two? Back to what? Oh, in the... You can pick it up by hand with two people. Maybe. What if we put it on tailgate, backed it up? Maybe we do it without here. the poles and just get it on top of that right there, just by hand, and then throw the poles on and wiggle it in. Yeah, that might work. Let's try that. So we'll just try to get on top of that valence there without hitting the grill. Ready? Okay. Oh, it's a lot better. Now we put the holes through. Okay. All right, go forward a bit towards the front. I fell off my shoulders. <laughs> All right, it looks like you're sitting. <sighs> Better in yet, Luke? Okay. All right, we can let it sit there for a second. Oh boy! Your arms. I I lost my shoulders, so I couldn't. 
I couldn't pitch it. Okay, we probably should have taught game plan f first. Yeah, you're terrible. No, Here's no. the game plan. <laughs> get the get the whatever out of me muscles. I don't know. I don't do this stuff. What's it called? The lactic lactate? acid. I've also yeah. lactate, so that ain't right. I was close. Get the laxatives out. <laughs> Okay, we need to go down with the back. Oil paint is hitting. Sure we got the right engine for the car? Mm. <laughs> Just want full clarification here. I raise corn. <laughs> this Not is engine. this is out of my specialty. I usually use engine hoists. I usually Same. start fires. <laughs> engine swap in cornfield, they said. No one said that. Yeah. You said no that. No one said that. <laughs> no one said that. That was on me. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to lift it. You guys just do whatever you got to do. Oh, we're close. Yep. Oh, it needs to go. Just that. Oh, no. I can feel it hitting the throw-out bearing. So right now it's sitting on top of the throw-out bearing. So we need to go up. A little bit forward and then right back in. I'll I'll lift the weight, you guys do the movements. Ready? Okay. Come forward a little if you can. Is that it? Okay, yep, go in. Yes. Okay, we're close. How did that happen? Magic. Not a real big fan of this view right here, Kevin. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh. I think this is preventing it. Oh, wait. It might be the splines. The what? The splines on the... Uh... Oh, no. Splines always match up perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> what we can maybe do now is get a floor jack under the oil pan and do most of the work with just a floor jack. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. If, uh, do, you wanna, do you guys want to sit here and here? Yeah, I can. Oh. That might actually fix everything. Oh, Mook, you got to weigh more. I'm a little. See, I'm going to have to leave here in front of Marshall Town to go get more oxygen and sit away if you don't need me. There she goes. Oh, yeah. That looks good. All right, well, our trans is bolted <laughs> to the engine. Now we need to figure out how the hell to get these engine mounts in. Can we get off? Yeah, you guys can hop off. <sighs> oh, let's take a break for some water. What do you say, Moot? Okay. Your guys' car is messy. That's after I vacuumed the poop sludge slushy out from under the seat. And then I dropped the vacuum and it went in my mouth. And I'm honestly surprised I'm still alive. <laughs> Well, the good news is it's definitely going to go in because we ripped this motor mount off. Oh. You're probably supposed to pull these whole brackets off in hindsight. But there's so much poop in there, I couldn't even see that those were bolted on. I thought like everything else they were welded. So. Professional morons. Yeah. Yay. Now that this one's been obliterated. Ding. Done. We'll just get some big zip ties and zip tie this one on. Call it good. Hey, one motor mount is better than no motor mounts, right? Yeah. 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 There it is. Engine swap in a cornfield. I think I've said that a hundred times. I think you have too. You're probably going to get sick of it while you're editing. Boom. You're going to be like, shut up, Kevin. She was right. It's time to start putting some accessories on, such as the starter. No, it's not. I forgot to prime the clutch. And if I put the starter on, I can't prime the clutch. So it's time to prime the clutch. Down. Up. Yeah, I think we're good. Does it feel like there's a clutch there? Yeah. That's open now. All right, let off. Loot again. All right, we have a clutch. Let's get a starter in it. That car's heckin' small. I don't know why y'all think I like it. I don't. Okay, I gotta remember how the hell this goes in. 
positive wire has a small terminal and is grounded. Positive colored wire, which is the negative. And the other one's the negative positive. Yeah. So, in all actuality, you could hook these up either way and most of the stuff, like the lights and stuff, would work. But, um, for whatever reason, that last time I was playing with this, I only got it all to work one direction. So I don't know if there's a diode somewhere in line or what, but I think someone has reversed the polarity from the factory to what most cars run, negative ground. So who knows what all has been done to this. Most of the time, if you need to check polarity, the radio has a case ground and there's electronics in there and diodes and stuff, and that'll only work one direction. So. I don't think our radio works at all, so I can't use that to verify everything, but I know these terminals have been changed so that this small terminal is on the negative because there's two different size terminals on a battery post. So with all that being said, I'm gonna unplug the intake. There's a battery in this car, there's a starter in this car, this engine is fully bolted in. It's full of oil, we primed it all last time, everything should be good to go. I'm gonna go tap the key and see if this thing cranks. Here we go. You can tell that motor mount's definitely ripped off. Yeah. Whoops. Probably have to get some big old zip ties or something and bolt that down. But hey, this thing just cranks for the first time in like a million years. And it doesn't seem to be stuck in gear. Everything seems to be engaged fine. So I think we're good to go ahead and move forward with putting accessories back on, getting carburetors, fuel, air, everything we need. Light it off and do some donuts. Coal, I'm gonna take, oh yes. Cole, I'm stealing these. I owe you two zip ties. Three zip ties. So if you didn't see part one, we're actually uh, at another YouTuber's property here. This is Cole the Corn Star's property. And he has um, a, a farming channel, as you can tell here. He found a weapon. <laughs> so you can check him out. Here's a link right up here. He's been restoring this house. Shows you a lot of stuff on the everyday life of an Iowa farmer cleaning up a scrap pile, which is how we got here, because there's cars in the scrap pile. So, pretty cool stuff they do out here. You can check him out right here on YouTube. Cole the Corn Star. Okay, well, since we ripped this motor mount in half, let's uh, go ahead and make ourselves a new one. Definitely never seen anyone else do this before. Redundancy is key. Now let's see if it shakes around like crazy. Contact. That's just because they're rubber, you know? That'll keep it from torquing over for sure and ripping itself out. Good stuff, good stuff. Let's hook up an ignition system, throw a little fuel down its throat and see what happens. So before we try to light this thing off, we're gonna see if we have spark at all. I have 12 volts from the positive side of the battery ran to the positive side of the coil. I've got a spark plug wire I found laying around cut up and jammed in there and then I have a wire from the negative post of the coil that I'm just going to ground out. You can see that that guy over there sparks. So if I go here I can see spark. You guys probably can't. Here's a way to show you spark. Something's flammable and then a spark. So yeah there we go. Spark, makes fire, goes boom. Okay, so we know our coil works. The next thing we're gonna confirm is the operation of our uh, points system here. Now the way the points work is there's lobes right here on this guy in the center. And as these lobes pass this follower, they open these points. So what this does is while these are closed, it completes a circuit for this coil to have a negative charge right here. And as soon as those open, they disrupt that charge and all the energy stored in this coil shoots out through the coil wire in the center. So, with that being said, knowing how that operates, I can then use that theory of operation to diagnose to see if they're working properly. So, if we have 12 volts to one end of a test light, and we hook the negative lead to the negative lead of the points, and the points are closed, the test light will light. This means our points are in fact providing continuity from positive to negative. Now, normal operation I should open these and the light should go out. It does not. Okay this is why we had no spark. So what's happening here? I have our coil completely isolated so we know it's not an issue with that. Somewhere in this distributor something is making contact 
all of the time, not allowing these points to break their ground because the points aren't actually what's grounding it. It could be a couple things. The condenser could be bad and it could be internally shorted and just grounding from the wire to the case because the condenser connects right here, which shares a post with where this wire over here comes out of. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on here. You can look up a diagram or pictures of distributors and see a little better. So I'm gonna loosen this nut and see if our test light goes out when I disconnect the condenser, which would prove that is the condenser internally is shorted. Okay, the light's still on, which you would expect because our points are closed. Aha, it's not the condenser because the light is still on with the points open. So that means somewhere in this spring armature right here, we're shorting out, which, let's see, I think this plastic screw Oh, hang on. Let's see what we got going on here. Oh, I think I might have found it. Aha! This plastic bushing guy is either broken, melted, or was installed incorrectly to where this armature here was literally grounding into the body of the distributor, providing constant ground. So I bet if I was able to isolate that, which I think I can do by just Plugging in over here. So isolating that armature, I can open our points, and when I do, our test light turns off. So it was in fact just hitting the body of the distributor through this potentially broken or misshapen or something piece of plastic. I'm gonna go ahead and say broken because that does not look normal. Let's see if our um, spare engine over there has one of these. You. So here you can see the wiring a little better. This is our spring I was talking about. Comes to this post right here, which is where this one was grounding out. One wire exits the distributor to the negative post of the coil. The other one comes to the condenser right here. So I'm gonna pull this apart and see if I can get that plastic pin out because I can see he has a full circle on the bottom. So that right there is why we don't have spark. Fix that and this thing should pop off. Well. Dang it, this one's a totally different design. It has a metal stud through the middle with plastic end caps. It's actually a far better design, in my opinion, because it can't just fall off like the other one. Let me see if I can re-clock that or something to try to get that sucker to keep from uh, grounding out. Otherwise, we can harvest this whole distributor, although these points look horrible. Okay, I re-clocked our broken thing, and as you can see, now when I open the points, it disconnects the ground, and we'll short out the coil, and bada bing, bada boom, spark. I will JB weld this before we leave tonight, so that it has a chance in hell of staying on there. Otherwise, it'll probably run for two seconds and just go, wee, and then I'll lose spark, so we'll see. Then you'll lose it. Don't freaking lose it. I'm going to freaking lose it, Mook. No. Positive to the positive side of the coil. Points wire to the negative. <laughs> there we go. Shove that in there. Shove this in here. Give a little visual aid for the audience. Then when I open these points. There she goes. So we have spark. Clean up our cap and rotor, put it all back together. Throw a little gas down his throat and see if she makes noise. Let's do it. Meow. I got my test light on so I can watch to see if our points are working. Go ahead and crank it a little bit, Mook. There might still be some brake clean in it and it might make some noise. I don't know. Find out. Cranky. Our light is pulsing, which means we should absolutely have operating points. Means so. Good. I'm going to hit this with a little bit of brake clean, just a touch, because it's pretty much absolutely wide open. And if you can keep an eye on the oil pressure gauge, see if it moves, because we got that hooked up, go ahead and hit it. Hey, hey, hey. Oh my. Look at that. Oil pressure gauge went up. <laughs> that was a little bit smoky. Well, we got, we got spark and our timing's pretty close. Let's try it again. Let's say ye. I say ye. What did your oil pressure go up to? Did you get a reading? 40. 40? 40 marshmallows. Oh. Yeah. Pounds over O, whatever that means. Marshmallows. 
Go ahead. Cranking. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Hell yeah. There it is. You know, as I age and I do this more and more, I'm no longer like surprised and thrilled by the first start because <laughs> I know I put it together and I did all the, the wiring and everything and the theory and I know it's gonna fire every time. Not to sound cocky, it's just like, <laughs> just like there it is, it runs. Told you. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty cool. This thing for the first time since 1978. -ish. 1902. <laughs> has made some noise. Has gurgled. Wanna do it one more time? Yeah. I can't do it one more time. Go for it. <laughs> that's, that's fine. There's some on fire down there. Small oh, it's fire. not on fire anymore. <laughs> By the time I got over here, it was gone. <laughs> so what's left? We need to do alternator, radiator, water pump pulley, belt, an exhaust tube. Carburetors. Carburetors, fuel system, fuel, yeah. and drive. More marshmallows. Fight. Superhero pose, Kevin. God, we're stupid. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> they have to figure it out on their own. It doesn't take much. All right, so that's going to do it for part two of the Midget Revival. Out here in the middle of a cornfield with nothing but pure brute force and a couple hand tools and, like, one floor jack. But besides that, this is proof that you guys can swap engines in your garage with minimal tools. You don't need to have $100,000 worth of tools to do the stuff that we do. You can do it on the cheap, on your own, at home. With enough knowledge and ingenuity, anything is possible. Too I mean, look at Mook. She made a screwdriver corn cob. I don't know what you would, what do you use? This that? is a carburetor cleaning tool. For what I can demonstrate with your nose. That's okay. That's fine. <laughs> so we will see you right here next week for part three of the Midget Revival. We're going to get this thing running, do some donuts here in the dirt, and head on home, clean her up, and see how good this car really is. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you go down below, subscribe, hit like, comment about your favorite part, or anything else you want us to know. We read most of the comments. Mook deletes a lot of them. Yeah, so be nice. <laughs> I want to say thank you to Cole for letting us work on his property again. Subscribe to him. Subscribe to Junkyard Mook, Thunderhead 289, Dylan the Cool, Classic Mustangs 429, Buy Strip Garage, DeBosch Garage, Cars and Cameras, the whole gang. We'll see you right here next week on Junkyard Digs. Peace. Subscribe to Mook for more um, tool inventions. Original tool ideas. Yeah, Tang Tools, you, you listening? You listening? Uh, Phillips Corn Cob McGee. No. <laughs>